I'm pleased to introduce our commencement speaker, CC alumna Jane Lubchenco. Known as one of the world's leading ecologists, Dr. Lubchenco has enjoyed a career as an esteemed professor, policy expert, and government leader. With research focused on oceans, climate change, and interactions between the environment and human well-being, eight of Dr. Lubchenco's publications have been heralded and recognized as science citation classics. While maintaining an active scholarly life, Dr. Lubchenco has repeatedly answered the call to serve the academy and the nation. She was the president of the American Association for Advancement of Science and served on the National Academy of Sciences study on policy implications of global warming. In 2009, President Obama tapped Dr. Lubchenco to serve as undersecretary of ocean of sorry, of commerce for oceans and atmosphere and administrator of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Currently, Dr. Lubchenco is the Wayne and Gladys Valley Professor of Marine Biology and Distinguished Professor of Zoology at Oregon State University. A wonderful example of a scientific expert who started her intellectual journey with a liberal arts education, Dr. Lubchenco has been praised for her leadership in advocating that scientific knowledge should be effectively communicated to the public. To further this goal, she has co-founded three outreach organizations, the Leopold Leadership Program, the Communication Partnership for Science and the Sea, and Climate Central. Dr. Lubchenco has received numerous awards for her work, including being named 2010 Newsmaker of the Year by the scientific journal Nature, and receiving the 2013 Distinguished Public Service Award, which is the highest award the U.S. Coast Guard gives to a civilian. Dr. Dr. Lubchenco has received 19 honorary degrees, including one, the very best one, from Colorado College. Please, well, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jane Lubchenco. President Tiefenthaler, CC faculty, administrators and staff, members of the Board of Trustees, honorary degree recipients, families and friends who are here today, but especially the class of 2014. Happy graduation day. I'm sure that many of you are super excited this day has finally arrived. I am as well, but for a slightly different reason. Little did I know when President Tiefenthaler invited me many months ago that so many commencement speakers this year would become targets of campaigns by students and other powerful groups to disinvite them from speaking. In the last couple of weeks, Secretaries of State Condoleezza Rice and John Kerry, First Lady Michelle Obama, former Chancellor of UC Berkeley, the head of the International Monetary Fund, among other less well-known people, have all had students or powerful organizations lobby various schools to disinvite them. So my thanks to you, the class of 2014, for not asking President Tiefenthaler to disinvite me. <laughs> class of 2014, today is your day. It's a transition to an unbounded future. Now I know that idea is a little scary, but you'll be fine. CC has prepared you well. It has a stellar track record of producing grads who have contributed significantly to their families, their communities, and the world. My own CC education was outstanding, and so was that of my four sisters who graduated from CC after I did. A dynasty in one generation, as a 1980 article in the CC Bulletin called the five of us. Over a 15-year period, both prior to and under the block plan, we had different majors, different classmates, and overlapping faculty, but with a uniformly stellar education. My sister Annette was a religion major, class of 73, Mary, biology, 75, Peggy, environmental sciences, 77, and Carolyn, economics, 1980. 
My sisters' subsequent lives have been rich and full as moms, daughters, wives, and active citizens, as psychotherapists, an attorney, a businesswoman, a middle school and university science teacher. The CC education we received decades ago is still relevant today. Peggy, Carolyn, and Mary are here today, and we collectively celebrate our love of learning a la CC, a love of learning for the sake of learning across multiple disciplines, and an intense respect for critical thinking and evidence-based approaches. During the four years I was at the helm of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, I also saw firsthand how a number of CC alums excelled at their tough jobs as leaders in the departments of the Interior and Agriculture, at NASA, and the U.S. Geological Survey. They too spanned multiple decades in majors ranging from political science and physics to economics. They uniformly praise the education they received at CC. You, class of 14, you too have the smarts, and you have newly honed skills, and now it's your turn. Class of 2014, it's time to unleash your passion and follow your hearts. My words for you today are, one, be willing to take risks. Two, challenge conventional wisdom. And three, be of service to others. My goals today are twofold. One, to give you a window into public service, and two, to inspire you to be hopeful and fully engaged in creating solutions for our common future. Your time will not be easy, but it will be important. You grads know full well that we live in a new geological era, the Anthropocene. Unprecedented rates and types of change are so powerful and pervasive that they have literally changed the physical structure, the chemistry, and the biology of the oceans, the land, and the air, the entire planet. You grads know as well that many of the rates and scales of change are increasing. For example, in the oceans, impacts of climate change and ocean acidification, overfishing and destructive impact of some fishing gear, chemical and nutrient pollution and habitat loss are collectively resulting in depletion and degradation of oceans at a global scale. Those and other problems present immense challenges as we seek to provide even the most basic necessities for a growing human population, while also restoring the life support systems of the planet. We definitely have our work cut out for us. But, and this is a very important but, the news is not all bad. At the same time the rates of degradation are increasing, so too are the rates of creation and innova of innovative and effective solutions. Solutions that enable us to achieve economic and environmental progress. Solutions that remove perverse incentives. Solutions that unleash opportunity. And herein lies your opportunity. Your knowledge, your creativity, your passion are needed as never before. You millennials will chart our future. We are already witnessing more and more breakthrough solutions that are having demonstrable impact. For example, in the United States, after decades and decades of overfishing, we've turned the corner on overfishing and have policies in place that are returning fishing to both sustainability and profitability. The result? more fish in the ocean, more seafood on our plates, and healthier coastal communities. Solutions are indeed possible. Likewise, some communities, states, and re regions are creating novel solutions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in ways that enable economic growth. Some solutions involve new technologies. Some entail simply doing things more efficiently. And others result from changing incentives that drive behavior. Each of these approaches, and probably many more, 
are ripe for your engagement and creativity. I'm here to tell you that the environmental challenges we face are indeed daunting, but make no mistake, they can be tackled and they can be solved. And you will play a key role in creating those solutions. If you are smart and strategic about what you do, and if you want to make a difference. I've seen firsthand how very difficult change can be, but I've also seen firsthand that solutions are indeed possible. NOAA, the federal agency I led for four years, is the nation's ocean, climate, and weather agency. NOAA is responsible for everything from weather forecasts and warnings to climate records and assessments to fishery management, healthy oceans, and coasts. A tall portfolio, but all grounded solidly in good science. And despite the daunting and unprecedented challenges during the four years I was there, the most extreme weather ever recorded in U.S. history, a dysfunctional Congress, the economy in a tailspin, the worst oil disaster in U.S. history, and hyperpolarization of climate science. Despite those challenges, we were able to accomplish an impressive amount. Here are just five of our major accomplishments. One, we're ending overfishing in U.S. waters and are aligning economic and conservation incentives in ways that have truly transformed U.S. fisheries. Two, we put policies in place to protect the integrity of science so it can no longer be suppressed, distorted, or manipulated for political reasons. Three, we helped create the nation's first national ocean policy that puts stewardship of our oceans and coasts front and center. Four, we fixed a vital weather satellite program that was a national embarrassment, but key to our future. And five, we designed, launched, protected, and nurtured the National Climate Assessment released just two weeks ago, the most comprehensive, credible summary of climate impacts in the United States by region and by sector. So I know it's possible, even in tough circumstances, to solve problems and to make good things happen. That experience has given me new insights into what works and what doesn't work in affecting durable environmental changes. In the next few minutes, I plan to share some of what I've learned through five short stories. Stories, after all, are the way politicians in Washington, D.C. communicate with one another and with the public. You've all heard the president and our, your elected representatives tell stories. They do that because, as social scientists tell us, stories are sticky. We remember them. So, Harking back to my four years in D.C., here are a few short stories around three themes, being willing to take risks, challenge conventional wisdom, and be of service. Story number one is Dr. Jane goes to Washington, D.C. Now, I have to tell you, nobody in Washington could say Lubchenco, so I was always Dr. Jane, or just doctor. <laughs> I had never imagined working for the federal government because I was having too much fun doing rewarding things in the academic world. But when the president-elect asked if I had had NOAA, it turned my world upside down. I felt compelled to say yes, but I was hesitant. I was fearful. I was painfully aware of everything I'd have to give up to go to DC. But it was the right thing to do. And five years later, I don't regret it one bit. My sister Peggy deserves huge credit for helping me make the decision. And my husband Bruce made it possible by shouldering some of my research and advising, freeing me up to go serve the nation. You too should be willing to explore unanticipated options. Choose opportunities that stretch you in new directions. Options that enable you to serve the common good, to meet interesting people and to solve new problems. Don't limit yourself to the comfortable choice. Be willing to be vulnerable and to take risks. And in fact, you might be surprised at how useful something in your background will turn out to be if you can figure out how to connect the dots in a new context. For example, my background as a marine biologist 
turned out to be great preparation for the rough and tumble world of politics in DC. I knew, for example, how to swim with sharks. Seriously, in the world of Washington, communication is not just through words, it's through body language and context, and learning how to read the signs of what someone is not just saying verbally uh, is very important, useful information. Use what you know, but apply it in new situations. Story number two is about the weather satellites that I mentioned earlier. The context for the story is pretty simple. About 90% of the data that go into our weather models come from satellites, so they're critically important. The ones that are up there now are working just fine, giving us useful information. NOAA takes those data from its satellites, d runs its own models, but also passes them on to all of the private weather providers, uh, AccuWeather, Weather Channel, uh, et cetera. This program of which I'm speaking uh, was building the next generation of weather satellites. We inherited this program. It had been dysfunctional for decades. It was a mess, and it was vitally important to fix it and get it on a better track. Doing that was actually very, very difficult, uh, but we managed. Uh, we had to try unconventional approaches. We had to garner a lot of uh, different uh, support, but we fixed the program, put it back on track, and I was up on the Hill to tell members of Congress how we had fixed it, why it was so important, and why they needed to fund it. And this one member of Congress said to me, Doctor, I don't need your weather satellites. I have the weather channel. <laughs> and I thought, whoops, boy, did I blow very basic principles of communication. Know what your audience knows so you can connect the known to the related unknown. Story number three is about the Gulf oil spill, which was simultaneously a major environmental disaster, but also a social and economic disaster for the Gulf. I was one of six principals that met on a daily basis to coordinate the federal response. And sometime a couple months into the spill, uh, the president asked the vice president to travel to the Gulf and meet with fishermen and to describe to them what we were doing, what we knew, uh, what was going on. The vice president said, I'm happy to do that, but I don't know much about fisheries or what we're doing in the Gulf, so give me somebody who knows. So his people asked my people if I would fly with the vice president to the Gulf, brief him on the plane so that by the time we met with fishermen, he could be up to speed on uh, what we were talking about. So I described to him on the plane uh, what NOAA's roles were the science advisor to the Coast Guard, uh, determining where the oil was, where it will go based on weather and oceanographic models, uh, protecting marine mammals and sea turtles, assessing the damage to natural resources from the spill, which is still ongoing. But to the point of this particular visit, keeping seafood safe by closing areas to fishing where oil was present or would be present in the next two to three days based on our models. After closing those areas, we developed a series of rigorous tests to sample the seafood to determine uh, if, in fact, it was contaminated. And only after it had been determined free of oil and dispersants over and over would we reopen those areas to fishing. I described to him how oil is pretty nasty. It has toxins that are known to be carcinogens that those toxins, uh, when they, uh, that they affect different types of seafood differently. So fish, for example, can metabolize those toxins. And so after a period of time, even if they've been exposed, they can be free of the toxins uh, in their flesh. Uh, I described that shrimp and crabs are different. They can metabolize the toxins, but they do so more slowly and things like oysters and other bivalves, uh, once they're contaminated, that's it. They really can't cleanse themselves. So I was describing all this to the vice president on the plane, and he stopped me and he said, now, wait a minute, I thought you were a scientist. And I thought, oh my gosh, am I in trouble or what? I am a scientist, I said. And he said, but I just understood everything you told me. 
And I thought, wow, what a condemnation of all the scientists that have briefed him over the years. And one of my uh, pet peeves is that we need scientists and we need you science graduates to become bilingual. You need to be able to speak the language of science, but also speak the language of lay people because we need to engage more with society. In these remarks, I've highlighted uh, three stories for you. Um, one, I took a huge risk in going to DC, but my background as a marine biologist came in handy because I knew how to swim with sharks. Two, we challenged conventional wisdom in rescuing a seriously flawed weather satellite program, but still had to communicate the basic rationale for that program. Uh, with a member of the house saying to me, doctor, I don't need your weather satellites, I have the weather channel. And three, being effective means being able to communicate technical and non-technical uh, audiences alike. With the vice president saying to me, hey, wait a minute, I thought you were a scientist. Here's one final story to round things out. It's about my very first day on the job at NOAA. When one is nominated for a position that requires Senate confirmation, you don't dare uh, do anything that would suggest you take your confirmation for granted. Uh, so I had not been in my offices until I was actually sworn in. I was walking around, opening up doors, checking out the view, and I opened up the door to a semi-private bathroom, and there on the floor was a Norway rat, a very large Norway rat with a very long tail, and the rat was wet. And I kind of went, oh, and the rat looked startled as well. And then it proceeded to run across the floor, jump up on the edge of the toilet bowl, and dive headfirst and disappear into my toilet. And I thought, well now, I don't think I'm going to be using that toilet for a while. My staff was completely freaked out, completely freaked out that this had happened. You know, they wanted to make a good impression. Word of this got out, and the gossip columnist for the Washington Post decided this was too juicy. You know, there are all these stories about what one administration leaves behind for the next administration. Rats, you know, he just really riffed off this. Uh, and uh, not only did he write about it, but they commissioned a cartoonist, very well-known cartoonist, to do a, a cartoon of a rat doing a swan dive into my toilet. So I decided, once I started thinking about this, I'm not going to use that toilet. I'm going down the hall for a while. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized nobody had been in that office for five months. The pipes were nice and dry. It was a great cozy place to hang out if you're a rat. And I figured all I really needed to do was to start flushing the toilet on a regular basis and make that a less hospitable place for that rat. So for the next couple of weeks, that's what I did, using the toilet down the hall, but flushing my toilet. And after a couple of weeks, nobody had seen the rat. I decided, OK, it's gone, no problem, and no one ever saw it again. My staff said to me later, nobody but a scientist. Nobody but a biologist would actually think logically about a problem as gross as that and actually come up with a reasonable solution. So there you have it, stories from DC, from sharks to rats, with special emphasis on taking risks, challenging conventional wisdom, and public service. And I'll leave you with a few thoughts. You millennials, because of your numbers and your attitudes, are primed to have immense influence on the direction of our country and the world. Your votes, assuming you will vote, will elect the next six presidents of the United States. Those of you fortunate enough to have an education like what you've received at CC position you to be leaders in your generation and problem solvers for multiple generations. The country needs environmental problem solvers across all areas of employment, government, industry, NGO, and academia. Now is your time. You are our hope. Be bold, take risks, think in unconventional ways, and give back 
by serving others as well as yourselves. Oh, and tell a few stories and laugh along the way as well. Congratulations, class of 2014.